right, everybody, we are going to talk about an extremely important topic in general surgery, and that is appendicitis. You've probably run into this many, many times. A lot of you have probably had it personally, like me. Um, you, you're going to see this all the time. It is very, very, very important that you know how to identify this because obviously the more prevalent something is, the more you're going to run into it, and therefore the most, the more important it is to uh, be able to um, know how to work this up and identify it and know some of your, um, some of your important differentials, which we're going to run through. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the little I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you very, very much who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. Now, appendicitis is basically infectious inflammation of the appendix, right? It's just in the name. Now, what is the appendix? The appendix is a little tubular structure that comes off the cecum. Remember, the cecum is that little pouch, the very, very first part of the large bowel um, as we begin the ascending colon. And actually, the word vermiform means worm-like, and that's exactly what the structure looks like when you take it out. It looks just like a worm. Um, now, why does this happen? This happens because of an obstruction. And that is very, very common um, when you're talking about pathological processes. So um, think of cholecystitis. Why does it happen? Because you have a gallstone that is blocking the neck or the, uh, the cystic duct of the gallbladder and you can get stasis and bacterial infection. Or older men with BPH blocks off the urethra, increases your risk of a bladder infection. So we see this all the time. We see it all the time. And so this is a blockage. Now, in children, there is a slightly more common cause than the fecalith, which is the big cause of adults, which by the way, the fecalith is just calcified poop. So in children, it's lymphoid hyper hyperplasia. What does that mean? just kind of means inflamed lymph nodes. And so that is actually the number one cause in children. Now you've probably heard lymphoid hyperplasia before. Where else does lymphoid hyperplasia come into play? Think of abdominal pathologies in children. Intussusception. So it can serve as a lead point for intussusception. And as a matter of fact, um, we see the cause of lymphoid hyperplasia in children is typically a viral gastroenteritis. And so look for that in the history. Um, maybe there, maybe not, but uh, worth knowing. So we usually associate appendicitis with right lower quadrant pain. And that is the classic presentation. But when appendicitis starts out, it starts out periumbilical and then gradually migrates to the right. Um, and then if that's not treated, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And then eventually the pain will kind of subside a little bit, but then it'll come back with a vengeance in the form of peritonitis. And that's due to a rupture. And that's when you get the guarding and the rebound tenderness and all that stuff. Okay, so um, important that you know um, that this is sort of a, uh, an evolving pain. Uh, so what is missed appendicitis? So we have acute appendicitis. That is something to think of when this is new, when the pain started within the last day or so. Missed appendicitis is exactly what it sounds like. It's a diagnosis of appendicitis that was missed. So it could be for a couple reasons. Maybe the patient never came into the hospital. They thought they'd stick it out. Or maybe the patient did come into the hospital and they were misdiagnosed. So look for that in the history. And when we're talking about missed appendicitis, that's where we really run into the big risk of complication. Because the longer appendicitis goes on, the more likely you are to have a rupture or an abscess. Now, this is important. Appendicitis should always be considered in any patient with acute atraumatic abdominal pain who has not had an appendectomy. Um, so we kind of talked about this stuff. What I really want to bring up here is that the pain of appendicitis is usually constant rather than colicky. And the reason for that is because this is due 
to inflammation. And inflammation doesn't come and go. It's there, it's there. Now, contrast this to some other things, like biliary colic, where you have a blockage of your gallbladder but no inflammation. That is going to be pain that comes and goes. Essentially, you have peristalsis behind the blockage, and peristalsis is sort of rhythmic, intermittent contractions, and that's going to coincide with the pain. Uh, similar to a, a nephrolithiasis, where you have a blockage of the ureter against the kidney. And so that causes a colicky pain as well. Similar to something we just talked about, into susception, where you have a blockage in the small intestine and you've got peristalsis behind that. That also causes a colicky pain. This is inflammation. So this pain uh, is more constant. Now, there are a number of important, um, well, maybe not important. There's one that's really important, McBurney's point. And then there are a number of slightly less important physical signs, which I'll show you in a little bit. So this is McBurney's point, and it's very easy to identify. All you need to do is palpate the anterior superior iliac spine and find the umbilicus, which I hope you'd be able to do that. And then it's one third the way towards the umbilicus. And if there is tenderness there, that is a positive McBurney's point. Now there's another sign, um, it's not quite as useful, it's called Rovsing sign, and what we do there is we actually push on the left lower quadrant and kind of push it towards the right, and if you elicit pain from that, that's called a positive Rovsing sign. We also have the psoas sign, and the obturator sign, you can look that up if you want. Um, they're not super sensitive and specific. Really, appendicitis is a game of evidence. There's no one sign, one lab that is going to tip us off that this has to be appendicitis. A lot of them are nonspecific, um, not always very sensitive. And so it's a matter of collecting evidence. Now, obviously, the most sensitive and specific is going to be imaging. Now your differential uh, for right lower quadrant pain is pretty substantial, so consider these things. Um, I put some of the things that would help you with your differential. Make sure you're always considering OBGYN problems, and that needs to be part of your lab. So your lab workup, you're going to get a CBC. You can get either a BMP or a CMP. We're typically not thinking liver pathologies when we've got right lower quadrant pain. Your analysis is going to be important as well. Um, that can cause um, that can cause a similar pattern of pain. And then beta HCG is important because we've got to make sure that the woman is not pregnant. Anytime we're talking lower abdominal pain, we've got to be thinking OB causes. Um, these are your various causes of abdominal pain, but it is important to know um, that there's overlap. So a patient, for instance, with appendicitis may tell you I've got lower abdominal pain. They might point here or they might point here. It's not perfect. So you've, uh, the way I go about this is let's say I've got a patient with left upper quadrant pain. I always think of the adjacent boxes. So I would think here too and here too. So that's how I do it. I don't know if it's evidence-based, but uh, I've found that useful. Okay, so what would we expect to see lab-wise? Not a whole lot. So on CBC, you may see uh, a leukocytosis with a left shift. That is very nonspecific, but again, it kind of uh, plays into your evidence bag. Um, Certainly not having an elevated white count does not exclude appendicitis. Um, you could also get an elevated sed rate. I typically am not a fan of ordering those unless I'm dealing with rheumatologic conditions. Uh, but you can include that on your order list and gives you a little bit more, um, you know, more evidence. Uh, but otherwise, everything else is pretty unremarkable. Now, the diagnosis has changed quite a bit, how we go about this. So it used to be we could start out with an x-ray and then go to a CT. Uh, but now we really don't do x-rays anymore when we're suspecting appendicitis. So there are a lot of conflicting recommendations, not only in the literature, but also in review books. And so, you know, I did my best to try to figure out what is the best advice for me to give you for your exam. And this is the consensus of after spending a few hours uh, looking this stuff up and 
obviously taking into consideration uh, the practice that I've been exposed to. And so the best initial test for anybody, if you're suspecting acute appendicitis, is ultrasound, okay? Now, here's the problem. Ultrasound is operator dependent. So if you don't know how to do an ultrasound of an appendix, it's not going to be a good test. On the other hand, if you've done them many, many times and you know what you're doing, it's a great test. Unfortunately, a lot of docs are just not comfortable in their ultrasound skills. Either they weren't trained or they're just they don't want to take the risk. And so instead, they'll go to a secondary imaging test like an MRI or a CT, uh, very commonly CT if we're dealing with an adult, and, uh, you know, kind of pass the buck on to the radiologist. But on your exam, you should order an ultrasound first because ultrasound is really good and we can avoid ionizing radiation. Now, if we're talking about a pediatric patient, i.e. a child, or a pregnant patient, i.e. a woman with a child growing in her, then instead of doing CT as our secondary test, we actually do MRI. And the reason, again, is that we want to avoid that ionizing radiation, uh, especially in children. There aren't many reasons why we would do an x-ray or a CT on a child. Um, I can think of, you know, x-ray, obviously, if there's a fracture. There are some other things that we may do x-rays for, like abdominal pathologies, like if we're suspecting necrotizing enterocolitis or we're expecting, uh, we're suspecting some sort of maybe a bowel obstruction or a volvulus or something like that. Uh, but for appendicitis, we do not do CT in children. We do ultrasound. If that's not conclusive, then we go for MRI. Now, in non-pregnant adults, then CT will be your next test. MRI is expensive, so we try not to do it if we don't have to. A little bit of ionizing radiation in adults is probably not a huge deal. Um, but the big thing to remember, children and women with children uh, go for MRI as your secondary test. Everyone else, you can go ahead and do a CT Plain radiographs are no longer regarded as helpful, so do not choose that. That is the wrong answer choice. Now, I do include it here because I want you to see this fecal lith right here. If you saw this on abdominal x-ray, in addition to typical appendicitis signs, then you got your diagnosis right there, but we do not go for abdominal x-ray in our workup anymore. Okay, so I'm not going to run in through all the radiographic features of appendicitis, but there are some important things. So here's a normal appendix. Um, with these inflamed appendices, um, what we will often see is if you look at a sort of longitudinal view, rather than have this nice sort of worm-like appearance, it might look kind of more like a spoon. Um, so that's one way you might see it. Uh, another way that it may be described to you is the diameter of the appendix is more than six millimeters. That is suggestive of, of appendicitis too. Now here is a normal appendix on CT. Another way this could be explained to you, and I actually have it right here, is fat stranding. Okay. So... These are just buzzwords, okay? I'm not gonna run through, you know, here's how you identify it on CT. I am not a radiologist. There are plenty of videos on YouTube where people much more experienced in radiology than I am uh, will explain it to you. And I would suggest you go and watch that. But as far as appendicitis, I don't really expect pictures to come up on your exam, uh, but things like fat stranding, more than six millimeters, fecal lith, you need to know those words because that will be tested. Now, the treatment for these patients once acute appendicitis has been identified is to prep them for surgery. So NPO, admit them, IV fluids, we don't want them dehydrated, and then very important, pain control. And you should actually be doing that right away. Um, this is typically going to be with narcotics. Uh, Preoperative antibiotics are indicated, so cefoxetin would be good there. Um, and then 
the best next step then is appendectomy should be performed within 24 hours. This is just some of my advice for USMLE. Um, Non-operative management for appendicitis exists, and we're talking hardcore IV antibiotics admission, and then see if it resolves. About 20% of cases of appendicitis do actually just resolve on their own without any treatment, um, but we give antibiotics. Now, that said, I don't think the USMLE is going to test you on that err on the side of surgical management. USMLE does expect you to identify acute appendicitis and know what imaging tests to order, so make sure ultrasound first. In a pregnant person or a child, MRI. In anyone else, you can go with CT. On CCS, if you get one of these cases, and I suspect you very well may because this is very basic and common, uh, again, go with operative management and make sure you order that surgical consult early. As soon as you've made that diagnosis on imaging, time to call surgery. And then in the U.S., lap appy is the most common approach. Now, missed appendicitis, we kind of already talked about, but this raises your risk of complications one of those complications are an abscess. If there is an abscess, you've got to drain that abscess. And so we go with CT guided percutaneous drainage. That would be your next step. Of course, we're doing all the other things, you know, NPO, IV fluids, antiemetics, pain control, and all that stuff, but we, and antibiotics, but um, we, we've got to actually drain this abscess first before we open the patient up. All right, make sure your antibiotics cover gram negatives and anaerobes. So piperacillin tazobactam would be a great drug to give in this case. And the laparoscopic approach is preferred both in uncomplicated and complicated appendicitis. So here you can see an abscess. And here it's even more obvious. Um, so here's your abscess here, and you actually see the fecal lift. Now, appendectomies, like I said, are almost always performed laparoscopically in the U.S. If you find the appendix and it doesn't look inflamed, you're still going to take it out. But what you should do then is look for a Meckel's diverticulum because that could actually be the cause. You could have an inflamed Meckel's diverticulum. Um, and so you want to remove that, especially if you're talking about a child. Complications are sort of your general abdominal surgery complications. And then a subphrenic abscess is kind of a unique complication. Um, so what we're looking at here is a patient who recently had abdominal surgery, and now they're coming in with uh, shortness of breath and hiccups. What does that tell you? It tells you irritation of the diaphragm. That's pretty much it. Yeah, this is me. Um, so the summer before my fourth year of medical school, I was home for a few weeks and I was planning on this wonderful, relaxing time. I went out to the bar with some friends I hadn't seen because, you know, I lived 600 miles from my medical school, is 600 miles from, from my, my home, from my family's home. I was out with some friends, had some belly pain, thought maybe I drank too much, maybe I ate something, went home, Pain just started getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, I'm like, you know what? This is feeling like maybe appendicitis. So I go to the hospital. I get morphine for the first time. It was great. Pain went away. Surgeon comes in, uh, orders the CT, go in for the CT. She said, I don't see anything. I'll admit you, but I think you're just constipated. Uh, it's always great when you hear that. Um, she did rectal suppositories, all sorts of dehumanizing things. Eventually, she gave in, did the appendectomy. She pulled it out. She told me it's gray uh, after the surgery, obviously, not during the surgery. Um, she told me it's gray, looked like nothing. Um, she was probably pretty annoyed by me. Pathology came back. What do you know? Packed with neutrophils. It was appendicitis. So, you know, you got healthcare professionals. It's probably a good idea to listen to them. All right, that's all I got for you, so we'll see you next time.